You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Uh, this is the second time I'm doing an intro because uh, <laughs> we started to record and then we, we had to. Record. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we realized that the new talk, uh, talk uh, the podcast that we have on Wednesdays is called Talkville uh-huh. and the Talkville sign was up. And we didn't realize it in the wide shot. So right. now we have to re-record this. But you, sh- I didn't even need to tell you that because you didn't need to know. And you're listening. But you're listening. You don't care. Guys, thank you for listening to this podcast. Thank you for tuning in each week. There's so many podcasts. You tune in to us, whether it's Tuesday when we come out or whether it's a weekend, whatever. You make your make time for this podcast. And it means the world to me. And I couldn't, I couldn't do it without you. If you're just here for Cassidy Freeman, I hope you stick around. Please subscribe. Write a review. It helps the podcast so much. Our handles are at Inside of You Pod on Twitter, Inside of You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. That's exactly right. And we love uh, messages. We love uh, re- reviews and uh, spread the word. Um, also, I'm on Cameo. If you want to say hello to me or I can say hello to you and a happy birthday. Uh, also, the Inside of You online store has a bunch of awesome new stuff, a new zip up jacket, uh, Smallville merch, Lexmas scripts, Smallville stuff signed. Uh, uh, mugs, glasses, tons of cool stuff. Get on the Inside of You online store. Also, patrons, I couldn't do this podcast without you. You know that, I tell you every week. Uh, these are folks who would join my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash inside of you. And I'll message you after you join. You really help the podcast. And part of the top tiers is I read your names out at the end of the uh, podcast. Uh, there are other perks too and things. I'm actually Zooming all of my top tier patrons uh tomorrow cool yeah Very cool. so it'll be nice i'll get on the get on the video with all of them and say hello and thank you and and see what they're up to and uh that will be nice uh also the band sunspin my band my album's coming out soon so keep looking sunspin.com it's probably gonna come out in september uh maybe a little later we're finishing it up it's really good the, the actual theme song on the talkville podcast is uh it's the instrumental for a song we have on the album so it's really cool sweet and uh what else i will be in august at fan expo boston august 12th weekend doing small bill nights with tom welling lots of other great stuff trying to deal with my anxiety i hope you're dealing with your anxiety i hope you're dealing with life and taking things in stride and trying to enjoy things more ryan how are you i'm also trying to enjoy things more as well yeah yeah you're Just playing your sports you're playing, playing your soccer sport. on wednesday nights doing my little exercises <laughs> that's <laughs> good to yeah it, no it does help it's good. Yeah, I'm excited for my soccer game. I play goalie. Never played goalie before. I love it. It's awesome. How many times do you play? Uh, I mean, once a week. Really? Yeah. And you're doing all right? Yeah. I'm enjoying it. Wow. Yeah. That's a big role to take on, a goalie. Uh, no. I, I always wanted to play a uh, little league, I, well, little league version of soccer, whatever that is. I tried out when I was like eight years old. and then, Didn't make it. Uh, no. And then, but I stayed on the same team like till I was like 14. And so it was just this one kid who who got to be goalie the whole time. I played defense. It was a great team. Uh, nice kids, but I really wanted to play goalie. And uh, now I can. Now you can. You're making your dreams come true. Come on, dreams come true. I love it. I love it. Well, guys, thank you again for sticking around. And uh, subscribe, all that stuff. Keep listening. Cassidy Freeman, this is a fun interview. She's great. Righteous Gemstone. She was on Smallville. We talked about that. She kind of took over from my character, Lex Luthor. We talk about that. We talk about life and uh, everything else in between let's get inside of cassidy freeman it's my point of view you're listening to inside of you with michael rosenbaum inside of you with michael rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience wow i got the privilege of meeting the baby Gigi. Did. What a you damn really treat that was. She is, you know, I hate to say it. I mean, I know I, I don't hate to say it, but don't you hate when people are like, oh, here's my new baby. And, and you're just like, oh my gosh, your baby's so cute. This is the cutest yeah. little, but like your kid is actually incredibly cute. Thank um, God. Because that, that would be, un- I mean, I'd have to lie probably, wouldn't I? I'd probably have to say, oh my gosh, you look would. at that. Yeah, you would have to lie. And I don't think you'd be that bad at it. But I, I do think I would I would sense that you were lying. <laughs> would you? Especially if I went, oh, I, if I said, oh, would you look at that? <laughs> <laughs> would, would you look at that? Would you look at that? But Gigi is adorable. And you said Gigi's good on planes. She's great on planes. She's great on set. She's great in my trailer. I think she sleeps better in my trailer than she does in her room or our room because I 
share a room. Right. So she, you keep her with her on set for the uh, Righteous Gemstones. You keep her on set in the trailer? Not every day, but I did have the woman who's helping me out bring her uh, a couple of days just to sort of like know if it was possible. Is that called a nanny or is it just the woman? It is. Can we find an it's the woman? I call her my Sandy. Well, the woman, Sandy. the woman, the woman. I just feel isn't nanny a weird word or, or, or is am it? I just not accepting the fact that I'm no longer 15 and I have a nanny that I, works I, for I me. How, how old is Gigi, by the way? How old is Gigi? She's four and a half months, four and a half months now. See, I, I we were talking about this before, but people have this. Whenever you ask them how old you get, oh, my baby's sixty-seven weeks. I'm like, yeah. what does that mean? Why are you going with that? I don't even know how much. No, what a is woman. That? A woman did this to me on the plane yesterday. She was like, "How old's yours?" And I was like, four and a half months." And she's like, mm, "We're forty-seven weeks." And I was like, "I don't." Four, eight, twelve, sixteen, Why? twenty, four, twenty-eight. That's almost a year. That's almost ten months. Anyway, or something like that. They do this. They do. There's a reason they do this. Yeah, I want to hear the reason. Please. You want to know this reason? reason? Please. The reason they do this is because, um, at least what I think, pregnancy is uh, done by mo- by weeks right. instead of months. Because truth be told, if you did like how long is it? We always hear nine months, right? Nine months gestation. You carry a baby for nine months. Right. The truth is, you actually carry a baby for ten months. But it's really nine and a half months because, and I mean, this is pretty apropos given the last week we've just had, but a woman starts their pregnancy two weeks before they actually conceive. Really? So when you are a month pregnant, you're actually only two weeks since conceiving. But that's how they, that's the only way they can like, doctors can measure it and know when you should be giving birth or when you shouldn't be giving birth and where the growth should be of the fetus to make sure the fetus is okay and all of that. How many, uh, Ryan's calculating this. How many weeks am I, Ryan? <laughs> 50 times 52. Uh, 2,600. 2,600 weeks, folks. Michael Rosenbaum is 2,600 weeks today or actually July 11th. Um, I will be. Well, no, That's, actually today. Um, is your birthday July 11th? July 11th is my birthday. 7 I get free Slurpees. But doesn't at 7 Eleven, don't doesn't everybody get free Slurpees at 7 Eleven on 7 Eleven? Does everyone say Slurpee with an H? Did I do that? that did I say a Slurpee? You did. Was there, you did. A Slurpee there? <laughs> do you do you recall how we met? Yeah, I mean, look, there's when we actually met. And then there's like the months preceding that where I felt like I knew you because no one could speak to me without saying your name. Is that but true? Yeah. So you, and we'll get, I want to get into, you, you know, you growing up and Cassidy Freeman as a young girl, and what was going on and how and all that mm-hmm. happened, because that's kind of like, I want to, I want to hear the story. I want to know like what you were like and all this stuff, but you, and we'll, we can get into the small stuff now, but like we met because your old agent, I don't think she's your agent anymore. Schmidt. Schmidt. She's still your agent. She's not your agent, but she called me and said, Hey, you know, my, my, uh, client, um, Cassidy Freeman is taking over for your role. She didn't say it like that. She just said, you know, that she's a new character on Smallville and you've left and, you know, she'd like to, you know, I'd, I'd love if you just have a chat with her. So I remember that. And I remember we had a chat. Do you remember what the chat consisted of? I don't. I do. I know. I want you to know. <laughs> Bless you, Ryan. I was really stoned a lot that time in my life. So. You were really stoned? What? Were you a pot smoker? You don't appear to be a pot smoker. How? What does a pot smoker appear to be like? You know, someone who appears to be stoned. <laughs> okay. You never, like, you came across, you just always seemed like very professional, very with it. Yeah. Very, not that the, you're not. Not that pot smokers can't be with it. I'm just yeah. saying, I didn't think No, 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 think but tell me was. what the conversation was about. Let's let's leave my drug use to it. I, I th- we'll get into your drug use and your, your yeah, real. We will. Sincere. Uh, I, you know, I think it was just like, what can I expect? You know, I'm going up to Vancouver to shoot this. And, and I said, listen, it's the, well, the hardest job in the world is stepping in as a guest star. Mm. That's the hardest thing you can do is go on to a television series that's already established 
and say, hey, here I am. I'm Cassidy Freeman, and I'm taking over for Michael Rosenbaum, sort of, and I'm playing his sister, no, that, That's Tess. how it was always, yeah. That's and, how it was always described. And I just yeah. said, hey, the crew's great, and the cast is great, and they're going to be really warm to you. And mm-hmm. But I was lying. Because, uh, no, I wasn't. I was lying. But what was your experience? Like, you know, do you remember, like, were you nervous? You had to have been nervous. Absolutely, I was nervous. I would literally done one guest star and one pilot before booking that in my life. That's it? That's it. So I had no idea. And the, and the pilot that I had done before becoming Tess Mercer was um, another pilot for the CW that I did with Justin Hartley. So I weirdly had a touchstone coming with me. The fact that he was coming on as a series reg with me. Um, And it was terrifying. Also, weirdly, moving to Canada was difficult. Uh, Like, in 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 the world of cell phones and rent. I was still so young. Like, I didn't know how How to get an apartment. How old were you? I was 24. 24. I think I started Smallville when I was 26 or 27. That's crazy. I mean, you are a kid still. You're a kid. And now you're thrusted up into Canada, Vancouver, where it rains 90% of the time. And you're playing this character in the established show and starting season eight. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone was really nice to me. You know, but it did feel very lonely sometimes because, um, you know, Tom's awesome, but he's a pretty private person. And we developed a really sweet sort of like brother sister relationship. Um, maybe cause he felt bad for me, but, um, <laughs> we also both like, we're both kind of chill people. So we got along really well, but he's not going to be like, Hey, let's hang out. Um, and Justin, I also had that relationship with Justin. I tend to hang out with dudes more, um, right. than I do with women. Uh, and I don't know if that's cause like, I'd rather go out for a beer than like get my nails done. But, um, and that's very, um, that's a total, like, uh, generalization. But but have you always uh, been like a tomboy? Time, You've always been that way? Yeah, yeah. I grew up with brothers. I just feel more comfortable. I felt more comfortable with that. And I think, honestly, I think women in this industry kind of scared me. Because um, I didn't know if they were going to, like, be nice to me or eat me. Um, now, see, I don't want to step out of line here. But isn't that true? I always felt like you go to an audition and dudes are just kind of dudes. They're like, what's up? All right. Okay, right. man. Great. And they go in the audition. And I always felt like women were kind of like, that bitch. <laughs> you yeah. know, but did you feel like that? Is that is that a true thing that just based on what I have talked with my friends that are women that have yeah. expressed their experiences, that's sort of how I came up with that. Absolutely. And not only that, the, the that bitch is based in the rea- like the truth of that, the seed of that reaction is actually... I'm wildly insecure, and I think that that other woman is more fill in the blank, attractive, tall, right for the part, wearing the right thing, skinny, you know, voluptuous, whatever you want to say. Right. Like I'm gonna, it's all out of comparison, and I think that's what I, um, I was like hesitant. I like didn't want. I don't know, man. I just, uh, I just <laughs> treaded lightly. But um, I, I always refer to Smallville as sort of like my grad school. Because right. I, they, they were like, it's only going to go a year. Yeah, right. And it went three. And um, I just kind of stayed up there. And I and I watched. I watched a lot. I was very observant. Sometimes people would be like, you don't work today. Why are you on set? And I would be like, I don't know what I'm doing half the time. And I want to learn. Really? Um, you were that you felt yeah. like you were that green. Like you'd only done a guest star on something else. And you felt like you wanted to learn. And this is a great chance for you to learn on set i'm the kind of person that studies the route of where i'm driving before i put it into google maps like i want to know what the steps are before i get there because i don't want to be unprepared you're smart that's really smart i don't i just jump in the car and i go in fact i go to some of these conventions or whatever and i don't know where i'm going half the time and i land and i go just take me where i'm supposed to go point in the direction i'm where i'm supposed to be what i'm supposed to do and i'll just do it i just don't want the stress of knowing where i'm going but then i think you miss you miss out on being present a lot of times like this is where i am this is where i'm going let's have a i don't like to plan everything but i think i could be better at that no, and I think I, I totally hear you. I also think it's like if you're the kind of person that's okay with not knowing where you are or where you're going, then go with it. Right. If I could do that, 
you call it smart. I call it high functioning anxiety, but you know, potato, potato. <laughs> That's amazing. And now a word from our sponsor, better help. One of my favorite sponsors, by the way, uh, Ryan, what does burnout mean to you? Not like you see these guys that are burnouts. <laughs> no, like that's a, different. It's, it's completely different. Just uh, being depleted. Depleted uh, of energy. Overworked. Overworked. Not making enough time for yourself. Yep. Have you guys felt burnt out? I, I know I have. I constantly feel burnt out. It feels to me like I just don't have energy to do anything. And, you know, you've got to take time for yourself. You've got to pay attention to your body, your mind, and and BetterHelp is there for us. Ryan, I know, still uses BetterHelp. A lot still of my listeners, it. yep, mm -hmm. listen to BetterHelp. Um, life can be overwhelming. <laughs> it sure can. And many people are burned out without even knowing it. Symptoms can include lack of motivation, irritability, fatigue, and more. We associate burnout with work, but that's not the only cause. Any of our roles in life can lead us to feel burned out. BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to prioritize yourself. I don't know how many times I say this on the podcast. Be good to you. Be good to yourself. Talking with someone can help you figure out what's causing stress in your life. Um, I know that I get so in my head that I sometimes don't know what to do next. I don't. I'm overwhelmed with life. I'm overwhelmed. And I just tend to go back in the bedroom and just fall on my bed and try to sleep it off. Instead of dealing with my shit, mm -hmm. if I could say that, I don't think mm -hmm. BetterHelp cares. It's real stuff here I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But um, talking to a therapist, talking to someone, someone who's objective, someone who can, you know, who will listen to you, who's a professional, it helps. It really, truly helps. And um, don't take my word for it. Take Ryan's word for it. Take take uh, all all the patrons and all the people around the world that use BetterHelp. Yeah, take their word for it. Yeah. Um, BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, I can tell you that, especially living out here in California. You can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. And our listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash inside. That's BetterHelp, better, H-E-L-P.com slash inside inside of you is brought to you by con air turbo extreme steam and iron two in one. Oh man this thing is awesome this is the most powerful handheld steamer i've got it right here because it's so cool look at this look how beautiful this is it's so easy to use ryan it's the most powerful handheld steamer fast and easy wrinkle removal extra large Sole plate can be used vertical or horizontal. Also works without steam as a dry iron. Advanced heat technology is ready almost instantly and obliterates wrinkles with turbocharged dry steam. You don't understand. I don't go to the dry cleaners. I don't have time for it. I'm single. Okay? This thing helps me. You add a little water. You're going within seconds and your clothes look nice. You can go out. This is so easy and beautiful. Look at this thing. I recommend it highly. Uh, it's got four settings for delicate to turbo. It's perfect for all fabrics. Kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria. Sanitizes around the house and refreshes clothing. Easy to use. Great for at home or on the go. Go to Amazon and search for Conair Turbo Extreme Steam. You will not be sorry. This is a great product. Go to Amazon, search for Conair Turbo Extreme Steam. So you went up there blindly, and I, you know, besides the little conversation that we had, do you remember the first time you got on set on Smallville and you had to act, and you remember what was racing through your mind and trying mm -hmm. to breathe? What was going through your mind? Mm -hmm. Kevin Fair was directing the episode. Oh, Kevin Fair. I was, um, I was in my office, your office at the Luther mansion. Luther mansion and I was like, we, it was a scene. It wasn't like the first time you saw Tess Mercer, but we were shooting out of order that episode. It was the first time that she meets Lois Lane and Erica, who is just a gem of a human being was so kind to me. That is one woman that like immediately I was like, she's got my back. 
She is. Um, she's like that. And I think also because she, she deals with anxiety. We talked about it on the podcast. She deals with a lot of anxiety mm-hmm. and, and she, you know, and I think that she plans things out a lot like you do, but, um, yeah, you're right. She is. She's a, she's a different breed. She's just a really, she's so she down to earth. Yeah. She's also incredibly gorgeous. And yes. that unfortunately makes her a target. And I think she has, uh, done really well with that, with being a target. I think she is really genuine and authentic and, and kind. What do you mean when you say a target exactly? You know, like, uh, again, I, I can't make like a comparison when I think about dudes, because it's not like dudes say like, Oh, that guy's such a six pack. I'm going to fuck him up. Like, I'm going to really, I'm going to really be, be awful to him or I'm going to try and take him down. And that tends to be like, if a woman's, you know, like really beautiful. You try and find her faults, but I don't know, even the score or something. This is just something I've observed. I I got you. I'm stoked that there are gorgeous women. And frankly, my idea of gorgeous, I think is a wider swath than, um, Hollywood or a lot of people's. Um, I find, I find people being really genuine, really attractive. And I find people being really funny, really attractive. So, but I mean, she's just, Eric is just a gorgeous, gorgeous woman. That being said, let's get back to the scene and then we'll, we'll continue. Get back to the scene. She's dressed up like a French maid. And why? I'm, I, you, you don't I'm, have to tell me why. There's just I'm sure. No, because a, she was she was trying to she was in the Luther Mansion trying to get information, and that was her costume. Okay. Like she was like undercover <laughs> as a French maid, um, and I was okay. supposed to be like aggressively like <laughs> attracted to her and kind of like pushy in like a is this a lesbian scene or is this not is tess mercer a lesbian what where's the sexual energy here between these two women um kevin fair (laughs) really liked doing this but the one thing i remember him saying after the whole like first three takes he looked at me and he was like he like took me aside and was like cast i have to tell you something and i was like so eager so eager to do well and like show up and be a good little student. And I was like, yes, what's up? What's up? And he was like, you are eyebrow acting. And I was like, what? And he's like, you're just really expressive in your face. Can you like tone it down a little bit? What? And I guess from being on theater my whole life, I was like, ah! Were you just taken aback? Were you like, oh my God, I don't know what to do here. Well, how do I not do this? Or did you know? I took the, I took the note and I was like, Okay, of course it hurt. It stabbed me to my core that like it wasn't good. I also didn't understand that like we're gonna do forty seven takes, and we're gonna use three pieces of like four of them, and it's all gonna be two seconds. Yeah, long. we take you know we I mean? take every moment so seriously. Like, oh my gosh, this is hours and hours of me just yes. doing this, and they're gonna get the and they just need the best moments for a few pieces. Yeah, and we forget that so, every time we're on set, don't we? Yes. Yes, we really do. We really do because we think someone's like, like, um, like what's that, what's that, uh, movie with, um, where they're watching him all the time. Being John Malkovich. No, well, <laughs> yes. And, uh, they're watching yes, him. And, oh, 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 TV, uh, Jim Carrey. Yes. Jim Carrey. Yes, it was one. called Truman show. Truman show. Thank you, Ryan. Truman show. Thank you. God, 2,600 weeks. Um, so Truman Show, you know, they, we, we think someone's watching us all the time and everything we do is being seen and judged and is going to be in front of us. And it's not. It's literally. Microscope. But that takes a lot of courage to be, to mess it up. So did you, were messy. you like after each take, did you say, Kevin, is it less eyebrow acting? Is that better? <clears throat> no, no, no. I wasn't that communicative or confident at the time. Uh, so what I did is I literally, if you watch the first three episodes that I'm in in season eight, this is, I do this the whole time. Did you think you were going to get fired, by the way? Because I always feel like I'm going to get fired. I didn't. You didn't? You were like, thought, didn't. did you audition for the part? I did because I had just done a CW pilot. I only had to test for Warner Horizon. I only had to test for Warner. Really? Um, so, But I did. But it was a weird test. Remember tests? Those aren't a thing anymore either. Yeah. They used to 
bring out the best in me though. And the great thing about, you know, I always will say I hate auditioning. And, and by the way, I read somewhere where you said you love auditioning. So we'll, let's get to that. But uh, <laughs> fuck you for that. Oh God, but I, where, I, did, where did I say that? Sorry about my F-bomb folks. Uh, but I did, I said it. Yeah, can um, I, can I, can I set off F-bombs? You can set off F-bombs. I, you know, right. I, I just try not to, but like you could say whatever you want on the show. I just, I, I just try not to say F-bombs a lot. I'm getting That's better, lazy. right, Ryan? I get it. No, I get it. Yeah, I'm getting better. I don't think I F-bomb it too much or Rosenbaum it too much, but, um, oh. what, what, what was I saying? Or um, I'm, 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 something about auditioning. Oh, auditioning. Yes. I just get so worked up and. The greatest thing, you know, about being an actor is sometimes when you, you think is when you get an offer. And when you get an offer, you're like, oh, my God, I didn't have to audition for it. I'm so cool. Yeah, they just offered me the role. But it's the hardest thing because then you're going on set blindly and you, you know, you don't know if what you're going to do is what they're looking for. And when you test or when you audition, you're giving them if they like you, this is what they want. So mm -hmm. that's the that's the that's you know one. that you were a choice. You're, it was a you choice. Know, you know, you showed some cards and they were like, I like those cards. I right. want that person. You right. can go in with some confidence. Do you, yeah. Going in with an offer is kind of going like, am I being, why am I being hired? Because they just like, know I'm going to be good. They just are expecting right? greatness from me. <laughs> That's what that is. They're like, oh yeah, we'll hire him because uh, he's good. But they you know, don't. I but, always, yeah. I always thought whenever my agents would say something like this should be offer only. Part of my brain would go, then I don't think I should do it. <laughs> Why? I mean, I think that's someone else's part. Not like if, if it was the kind of thing that, oh, you've done a lot of these kind of guest stars. They should know you can do it. So it should be offer only. Or, sure. you know, this is not that it's beneath you, but it's like stuff you've already done. And my brain always went, there are, there are other actors coming up that need those roles to like, get their chops to like figure it out. Are you, are, take those are you saying them? you wouldn't accept an offer? Oh God. No. I, I mean, if I wanted <laughs> to do the project, I would, of course I would. Right. Yes. Did you, have you, or by the way, quickly about auditioning, why do you like yes. it so much? Is it because of what we just talked about? Because that you like to get us that you want them to see what they're getting or is it, do you, do you just really like the pressure and the stress and the bullshit of it all? And the rejection 90% of the time. <laughs> this feels like maybe a one-sided argument. <laughs> I don't like the, I don't like driving there, but no one does that anymore anyway. Right. Um, I don't like self-tapes nearly as much as I like going in the room. I just think I like performing. And when you're an actor in LA and you're not working on anything, auditions are your moment to perform. Um, and yeah, sometimes they totally suck. Sometimes it's like, an assistant with a latte and a dog doing the camera and reading with you. And you're like, who's going to see this and how am I supposed to connect with someone? Right. But sometimes you really have these really cool moments. And I just have a lot of, I have a lot of feelings, a lot of like memories of coming out of auditions in my twenties in LA when I was like first starting out and just feeling like I had just hit it out of the park, almost never booked it. But that feeling was so visceral and like, I don't know. Maybe it's like little girl from Chicago, but I was just like, I don't know. Hey, so did you always want to be an actress as a kid? Yes, I did. I did. My mom lied when I was three and um, said I was five <laughs> and put me in ballet because I was gigantic. And, um, <laughs> and it worked. I had no verbal skills, but they didn't care. They just thought I was a very not intelligent five-year-old and uh and and i got on stage and i i just loved dancing and and then i got into acting i got it i started auditioning for movies when i was like nine i got an agent in chicago i just loved it well your brother's jealous i know you have three brothers i do i have two biological and one adopted my adopted brother's not jealous because he's uh, he runs a really awesome high school in Chicago and he could care less. Um, I mean, he supports <laughs> me, loves me, but like it doesn't matter. Don't you have a brother? Yeah, brothers, I thought you had a brother that's an actor. I have two brothers that are actors. Both my biological brothers are actors. Do they ask and, you for your uh, help? They're like, hey, can you get me on uh, Righteous Gemstones? <laughs> no, but we work together a lot. And if they did ask me, I would say things like, I'd love to get whoever I want on the Righteous Gemstones or, or any show I'm on. I don't have that clout. You don't have that clout. 
I think people think that you have that clout, you, the proverbial you, because right. when I'm on Smallville, they're like, you know, my friends are like, hey, but I'm like, dude, they're hiring 99% guest stars that are Canadian guest stars. And mm-hmm. I have no say, at least I didn't have any say for years and years. Uh, you know, it's, it's really tough. I remember when finally I was the lead on a series and I was able to get a couple of my friends on the on the show, on a show. But it's it's very difficult to do that. You have to have, I mean, look, even... Brad Pitt tries to get his friends and stuff, and it's 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 not easy. It's like you have to be right for the part. That and I think you have to be one of like the producers. It has to be your show. Yeah. I mean, and even then, you have to fight for things because they'll be like, "Well, we can get someone with more Twitter followers." <laughs> Twitter. And you're like, who uses and you're Twitter like, anymore? Wow. I don't know. I they actually took away my verification because I didn't tweet enough. What? That's impossible. That's not a thing. It is. It's a total thing. They did it to me. You don't tweet enough, so they took away your verification. <laughs> they took away. No, I'm just wait, a civilian. <laughs> they took away your check mark. Is that what it is? Uh-huh. Did you wait, fight wait, back okay. and say, "Hey, I'm Cassidy Freeman"? No. You didn't care. No. You don't no. post a lot. Twi- twi- Twitter is like the lowest form of communication. What's the highest form of communication? TikTok. Do you TikTok? Just kidding. No, I don't actually. I don't. Are you not going to send any new baby GG TikToks? No, no. It's not in you. I mean, posting your kid online is like super controversial anyway. I'm just, I'm doing the best I can over here. Inside of You is brought to you by Geico. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Well, of course you would. After all, who doesn't love a great deal, right? And when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life, GEICO can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, add the easy-to-use GEICO mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance, and more. And choosing to switch to GEICO becomes an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to Geico.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. I think you're doing really well. You seem like you're really together. You're kind of like in your seat, kind of twisting around, doing your thing. You're, you're confident. You seem like you just got your shit together. Like That's I, really like, kind. Yeah. Like I need to call you for advice this time, 20 years later. Look, you have my number. You can always call me. Yeah. Seriously. Anytime. Do you, anytime, truthfully. Do you do you suffer from any anxiety? Do you deal with stress anxiety? I remember I, I know I heard something in an interview that you do have a little anxiety. Do, have you had anxiety since you were a kid? And what does that feel like? Mm. I don't know. We'd have to call my therapist to see if, <laughs> how far back my anxiety. It's good you're going to therapy. It's good that you're going um, to therapy. I think everyone at some point in their life or every week as I do, um, could benefit from talking to a therapist. I say Someone it all the time. A real therapist. Ryan right here, Ryan, you don't see him, but my engineer, he goes to therapy. I go to therapy. You go to therapy. Yeah. It's not like everybody, it's, awesome. it's right for everybody, but I think it is, is right for everybody. I, yeah. Again, not to project onto people what they should or shouldn't do with their lives, yeah. but, um, we used to live in communities with elders. That's what elders were. You know, and you had a question or you like wondered something and you like went to the elder and the elder would give you advice because they'd lived life. (laughs) Now people go to Google and Google is not an elder and neither is TikTok or some kid on, you know, whatever news streaming thing there is. Yeah. (laughs) No, this is good. This is good. So, but what about anxiety? No, but anxiety wise, is it something you had since you were a child? I think, I think so. I think, um, I've always been someone who needed to, uh, do really well. I had, I had a lot of, I, I don't know from where it was imposed, but this feeling of perfectionism, which I think is like a, um, I think that's goes kind of hand in hand with some anxiety, some people pleasing. That's, that's what I, that's my issue is I'm always trying to perfect everything to be great (laughs) at everything. And it's just, I suffer. Because it's impossible. It's impossible mm-hmm. to be great at everything, to be perfect at everything, to be perfect at anything. It's it's there's no such thing. And yet yeah. 
with me, if I'm not great, I feel like I failed. And mm-hmm. that is a terrible way to live your life. And I have started to get better about it. I'm starting, you know, I've been going to therapy and working on myself, but how do you deal with that? So what do you, what, what do you work on? What do you do? That, first of all, you don't, you don't give off that vibe just so you know. And I think that's, another well, I can't, important. or I won't work. If, you know, people, <laughs> no one wants to see someone who's just, you know, like that, but um, I right. try to be honest about it on this podcast. I, I try to, you no, know, that's, that's brave. I like that. Um, what, what do I do to battle that? Um, one of the things that I, that someone once asked me to do, and I thought it was really useful was make a list mentally, physically write things down. I write in a journal that's like physical because I think that I think it does something different than typing. Um, actually being able to like write with your hand and then see it in the paper and tactile world, which we're losing. Um, but I digress. Someone told me, make a list of the people that you admire and what you admire about them. And and how many of those reasons are because they're perfect? Like, what are the things that make your skin, you know, you know, when you watch something or you hear something or you see something and it just kind of makes your skin feel alive and you know that you're in the presence of, of realness, whether that's like a, a concert you go see. Um, we just saw Bonnie Bear in Asheville. It was so beautiful. Or it's, um, or, or it's a stage production or it's someone standing up for someone else's rights or it's, I don't know. It's just those things that I'm getting them now. And those like those feelings in your body where you're like, I'm in the, I'm in the presence of greatness. Very rarely is that greatness. Perfect. Very rarely does that greatness look or smell or seem like how you think you should be in order to be perfect. And so if we started actually giving props and love and admiring the things that give us that feeling rather than the things that look a certain way or seem a certain way, uh, I think we'd have a better connection to what is actually and what, what is actually perfect. I'm using um, quotation fingers. What? Uh, who? What do you? Who do you write when you write? What is it that you're writing down? Who is it that you're writing down? Oh, I I write. I just write like uh, I write to me. I write, I write like what I'm feeling that day. I also write weird poetry, um, and sometimes things will just come to me, and I'll just. I'll write them. Uh, What's weird? That stuff, Why is it weird? Poetry. I don't know. That's a great question. It's weird because sometimes it's campy or it rhymes. Um, and you, I think that's kind of, you know, you think of poetry, at least when I learned poetry in college and high school, it was like uh, the really avant-garde stuff was supposedly very smart and rhyming was more like campy and kid poetry or something. <laughs> right, right. And uh, sometimes really great poetry rhymes. Sometimes it's pleasing to the ear. Sometimes when you're like, it's like, it's like, um, it's like, it's like rap or, or um, freestyling or, you know, someone's like going on this total train and then they like <laughs> hit that last word and it actually rhymes. And there's this, another moment in your body when you're like, oh, you're just like, <laughs> she so said so. what? <laughs> yeah. Do you, you know, it's so funny. I'm thinking about this and I'm laughing out loud because it's so absurd the way I think I will write things and maybe inadvertently or on purpose, I'll be writing something that resembles poetry or something profound or something from the heart or something. And then I'll go, Oh my God, this is so pretentious. If anybody ever reads this, which they're not supposed to, because it's just for me, it's just me writing to help express myself but like, I don't want to be embarrassed when I'm dead. <laughs> so, That's not crazy. It's stupid. It's why I erased it because no, no, I don't no. want anybody to ever read it. And if they ever read it, they'll be just like, oh my God, this guy is nuts. I've had this same exact Why thought. do we do I that? I don't know anyone that hasn't had this thought, first of all. But I also kind of like, I'll, I'll write things in code to myself so that like if someone found it, they don't know what I'm actually talking about. <laughs> I have done that too. <laughs> you know I, mean? I have done that too with notes. With notes yeah. that I'm making. I remember I um, there were three girls like a long time ago that I was sort of seeing, but I, in case anybody saw uh, the email, let's get the, down to it. they uh-huh. wouldn't know, they wouldn't know if they saw the piece of paper, they wouldn't know that their names were on it. So, <laughs> so in other words, if I was like kind of talking to a girl named Cassidy Freeman, I'd say free. <laughs> and then right. I have, you know, if somebody was Margo, I'd put got. <laughs> Right. That's right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. so there, there's code. There's certain code yeah. that you put to protect yourself 
But, you know, you'd hope yeah. that no one ever finds the stuff. I mean, if people found your stuff, would you be mortified? Um, I think that's part of the letting go of perfectionism. Oh, God, I think I think this. when I was in my 20s, absolutely. Even most most of my 30s. But I think now, like, if I if someone found it, honestly, the only thing I think is like if someone reads this, it's because I'm dead. Right. And who cares if and, you're dead? And then I go like, oh, I want them to know authentic me. Oh, wow. And I'll go dark for a second. My mom passed away 10 years ago. And Sorry. her journal is one of the only things I have left. Um, we all had it. She wrote on a computer cause she was like very pragmatic and like, do, 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 do. and she, <clears throat> she wrote a lot about the cattle that she raised, which was not <laughs> super personal. And you had a cattle but, ranch in Montana. They had one, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. But like interspersed in between like weights and like what cattle were doing well and what weren't, um, there would be these little moments where she'd be like, I spoke to Cassidy today. She sounds happy. You know, or like, I don't don't know. I just, I loved getting to, to see those little moments of her. So, you know, maybe, maybe this is all coming to me now that I'm a new mom, but, um, I hope Gigi has like, I don't know. Gigi Gigi reads my journals. First of all, I hope she has a 10 years to do so because there's a lot of them, but I think it'll be cool for her to read my weird mind. But it sounds like it meant a lot to you to hear your mom's non sequiturs of these random thoughts of you that you were on her mind that you were totally. So that's that's pretty badass. Yeah, yeah. So keep writing in code if you have to. Okay. But I think I think it's important. Do you get? I don't think Margot is going to know that you wrote about it. Tell me about your anxiety, though. Tell me about like what you what you deal with. What does it feel like? What does anxiety feel like for you? Control. Um, I've often described myself as a loving controller right? and that's not other people. I don't like controlling people. I have no in, in, intention of doing that. It's more like situations. My brain uh, will try and find the worst case scenario and then already figure out how to get out of the worst case scenario before the thing even starts. I know. Yeah. I can understand that. And then I'll be like, I don't want to be caught with my like ass out. I don't want to be like, cause why? I, I don't know why. Like those moments though, when we do fall on our face and, and, and shit goes sideways and we don't have control. Those are the most magical moments. So what, what, what does that happen? When does that happen? When have you fell on your face? When have you, I think it's why I love the stage. I think, and speci- speaking specifically stage acting versus film acting. Although I think it's possible to find sometimes in film acting with the right circumstances that being said when you start a play a show and the train leaves the station and you're whatever happens on stage happens a light doesn't come you slip you fall your props not there your partner goes up like you know it just it's so it's full improvisation um which is probably why i love the job i'm doing right now so much the gemstones because these mother suckers are incredible improvisers and everything is just in the moment. And sometimes I find myself frustrated that I, I'm not, I don't feel, I'm, I feel, I feel like slow in the, um, in their presence often because it's like their brains are going so fast because they're not trying to figure out how not to, how to fix things. They're just like super in the moment. Um, but it's great practice. Do you ever get embarrassed? Do you ever get devastated? Do you ever feel overwhelming emotions or numbness or tingling with anxiety or with just acting or anything like that? I have gigantic emotions. Yes. Gigantic. Like, Explain gigantic emotions. emotions. Um, yeah, I don't, th- these also happened as a kid because in our house, my parents kind of didn't believe that big emotions did a lot for you. Um, which is probably why we're all actors. <laughs> so in other words, you'd lash out and go, I don't care. I hate you. And they're like, well, that's not working for you. No, it was really <laughs> anger. wasn't really where we, where I went at least I would go to like sadness. Um, cause I think when we're kids, we're like really tapped into things. Unlike when we're adults, if I cried at something, it would often be like, that's not going to do anything for you. <laughs> like it doesn't, it doesn't, <laughs> Your parents would say that? They'd say that's not going to do anything for you? 
No, my mom made me wear a shirt. My my mother, who I love very much, whenever I cried, she made me put a shirt on that had the word sniveling with a circle and a line through it. <laughs> we don't do this. <laughs> we don't do this. We don't snivel. It's not going to help you. Maybe that's what made you so tough and made you feel like a, like you call it a tomboy or whatever, like you like being around the Maybe. boys because you don't. Do you not cry that much? Are you not a crier? Oh no, I'm I'm a crier. You're you're emotional in front of Ben, your now, husband. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I, I, especially in the last year with the hormones that have been my reality. Like I remember right after I had Gigi, um, someone, Oh, it was the Olympics, which are very controversial, I guess, but I love the Olympics and I love, like, I love watching the Olympics. My brother and I used to just watch them. Clark, my middle brother, we used to just watch them like, obsessively. Um, they come on and everyone right after postpartum was like, have you started sobbing yet? And I was, and I looked at Ben and I was like, what, why, why do people keep asking me that? Like, I'm not going to sob. And then this commercial comes on commercial for the special Olympics. And it was about a pair of brothers and one of them started to go blind and the other brothers stayed with him and they were doing some like long distance skiing competition and they won the gold in the special Olympics. And at the end of this 30 second commercial, I am sobbing uncontrollably. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I cry, I cry at commercials, but I'm not like, a. if what you're asking is, do I, do I immediately go there? I don't. But you said gigantic emotions. Yeah. They're just big. They're big emotions. I, are, yeah. Do you have or any breakdowns? Have you ever broken down on set? No. And at work, I don't do that. Well, have you ever broken down when you leave set to go in your trailer? I've broken down on the drive home. And because you're, sure. you're reliving the day, you're reliving what you did and you feel like you failed? No, no. Usually something happened on set uh, that so, so, some, some, something was handled in a way that didn't feel safe to me in the moment. And I'm not talking anything serious. I'm just talking like someone wasn't as nice to me or someone didn't give me enough time to get ready or someone, you know, uh, I've never experienced like any kind of neglect or abuse on set in that way. But um do you remember Cy Peck? No. He was the, he was the, um, on Smallville, he, he may not have been there when you were there, but I think he was. He was the uh, PA for, like, the set PA, or the base camp PA, mm -hmm. who would, like, hang out at trailers and stuff. And he would always knock on my door and say, like, they're ready when you are. And I was, at the beginning, and be like, okay, like, immediately busting out the door and, like, ready to go and so eager. And he, <laughs> he was like, the sweetest man in maybe his 40s, early. I have no idea how old he was. Right. And he kind of pulled me aside at one point and he said, Cassidy, don't be so ready all the time. And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, just take a minute. Take your time. Wow. It, I've never heard a first AD or second AD or any AD ever say that in the I history know. of film. I know. Usually I it's like, we need you. It. They need you on set. And I'm usually pretty good. I'm usually like, you know, within a minute or two, I'm good. Like, but I always say this, because after you get to be, to do a lot of projects, after you're on set for a lot of hours, a lot of days, a lot of years, you start to question authority a little bit. And you start to say things, what you're supposed to, what you say, Sai, do they really need me on set right now? Or is no one else on set right now and I'll be the first one and I'll be waiting for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then Cy will say, uh, you could probably wait a few minutes. I go, why don't you get me after they've gotten any, everyone else or in somewhere in the middle. Yep. So you're not wasting time because a lot of time on set is wasted time. I could not agree with you more. And I remember Tom actually being really a great leader in that way. Where if he got called to set and he got to set and he had to wait more than 10 minutes, he would turn around and go back to his trailer. Yeah. Shows and, you and make them wait. It yeah. was it was it was funny because at first I was like, oh. And then I was like, oh, that's so smart. It's a lot of wasted time. You're very right. And I yeah. will always remember Sai for that reason. Do you do you like um, watching yourself? On like when I'm watching like, like when I, like, you're watching, watching Gemstones or Longmire or Smallville or Oh yeah. Yeah, I love it. I love it for a number of reasons. I love it because I get to relive the fun of doing it. Um, I love it because I get to uh, see what I did and kind of go like, ooh, maybe next time. Or 
I get to see the real moments that I, I, I don't know. I like to study myself and others. Um, I don't love watching myself with other people. <laughs> I know. I get that. Just, I get that. Yeah. Unless you watched it already and you know you're good, yes. then you can watch it with other people. And you're like, ah, watch this. This is going to be yeah. good. Yes. But when you're in that like weird horror movie that you don't know how it's going to turn out and they're like, come to our screening. And you're <laughs> like, I will bring no one to that. <laughs> Have you watched yourself and <laughs> gone, God, I am awful. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You have. <laughs> Yeah. What have you thought you were awful in? If that's the right thing. You've English. watched yourself and just been like, ooh. Have you done you've I done don't that? Know. I'll be honest. The things that the things that kind of make make me cringe are like sexy stuff. I, I don't have I'm not good at watching myself be So like, when you're sexing yeah. it up, you don't want anybody to see it, nor do you want to see yourself. Nope. So you just kind of nope. like going, nope, I don't have to see that. <laughs> Yeah, Who like did I'm you sex? Did you sex it up on Smallville with anybody? Like I'm my own dad. I'm like I don't want to see that. I can't see that. <laughs> I don't um, want to see that. Yeah, I feel like I sexed it up with everyone on Smallville. What? They were like, well, we haven't really done. Um, yeah, I had a whole thing with Zod, and I had a thing with Justin with Green Arrow, and then there was an alternate universe where Tom and I, Clark Kent and I. Wait, you made out like, with Tom? Yeah. How was that? Epic. <laughs> <laughs> He's I love that. You, I love that you just say that. You just like it. Epic. Where people are like, it was fine. It was, everything was Tom was really professional. He's like, that was epic. It was epic. No, I say that because I actually have a funny story. You remember Kelly Saunders? Oh, of course. Uh, and Brian Peterson. Um, Kelly was directing that episode. It's just so embarrassing. I can't believe I'm going to share it. You got to share it. You got to share it now. But this is the being messy. Don't be perfect. Um, so the, Tom and I were always like friends, but obviously he's an incredibly attractive man. And everyone on that show is attractive. Let's just be honest. Oh. Um, it's why it's on the CW. It's a comic book show. It was hard but, to be on. I always felt like I was the ugly duckling. I did forever. Oh, my, oh my God. God. Yeah, but go on. It's not about me. Are I you just wanna, serious? I swear to God, I always felt like, oh, my God, they're going to fire me because I'm not I'm not as good looking as everybody else. That's how I felt in the beginning. And then I thought, okay, you're pretty decent. They're not going to fire you. But it took time. You should have called me because literally everyone was like, Oh, you're here because uh, Michael left. Good luck. You'll never <laughs> no, they did not. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they did. Everyone. You, you'll never be as good of an actor. He was the best actor we've ever had on this show. What? He Come brought the on. show together. I'm not kidding. I'm not even, like, blowing the smoke up your skirt. They really. I was like, oh, dang. I better bring my A game to match uh, Rosenbaum. Well, that's um, nice of you to say. But. It was, uh, yeah, so you were, you were greatly loved. But, um... Tom, I think Tom and I were buddies. And so the, and I don't think we ever thought our characters would ever go, go to this place. So then when it was written in the script that it was like an alternate universe and it wasn't even, there was nothing um, like romantic about it or like sweet. It wasn't like all of his and Lois's stuff where they're like "Mm -hmm," smooch and like sparkles around. Um, It was very like, they already were dating and the alternate universe versions were like, obviously like hardcore into each other. So the scenes were like one of us would come and be the real and the other one would be the alternate. And so one of them was very taken aback by the other one being very forward. Uh, and there's this one scene where, where Tom comes into my office as alternate Tom and like takes me and like aggressively kisses me. And I'm like, you know, Tess Mercer in the real world is like, what is happening? And I'm supposed to be like really shocked and appalled and like grossed out. And about three takes in, Kelly pulls me aside and she's like, hey, so talk to me about what you think Tess is feeling in this moment. And I was like, I feel like Tess is like surprised, but also like trying to be strong, but doesn't really know what's happening. And she goes, OK, cool, because you're just smiling the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait. And she's like, ear to ear, really big smiles. And I was like, OK. <laughs> Like so embarrassing. Oh my god! But he, we both were very professional. And right. uh, Tom, you know, there's certain. Yeah, it's nice when you can trust and be friendly with the person. But watching it was tough for me. By the way, last small book question. Then we can move on to gemstone because I want to hear a few things. Because <laughs> uh, uh, did you were you friendly with Allison Mac? Yeah, you guys oh, yeah, were close. We used to, like 
we used to dog sit each other's dogs. Really? Strangely more, more communicative with her boyfriend, Chad. At the time, right? At the time. Yeah. Allison always had a lot going on. Um, and I, that didn't, you know, that was fine. She, she had meetings, she had girl groups that I think I was invited to once. And I, I, it just wasn't, wasn't my vibe. But she never, had, she never got you to go into a, one of those Nexium things. She never asked no. you to do that. Nothing. Never mm-hmm. said, Hey, this could be right for you. No, no. And I actually remember asking her, um, she invited me to like a ladies day at her house and I couldn't come for some reason. I don't know if I was out of town or something. And part of me kind of felt like, Oh, I'm, I'm left out. But then I was like, I don't know that a ladies day is my vibe. <laughs> um, yeah. so I just didn't, I didn't go and I'm glad I didn't. But I also, I remember once asking like, Oh, what are you doing over hiatus? And she was like, I'm going to a poetry camp in New York. And I was like, cool. Conversation ended there. Really? So, yeah, I guess I it was a shock to everybody. That's why I just kind of, I was just a little curious as to since oh, yeah. you're in the final seasons, is if there were any kind of like communications about it or like, hey, this would be right for you. Try this out because who knows? I mean, I always say like when I watch the documentary because I had no idea that, hey, you know, insecure Rosenbaum, this this is a, this is a thing that might be good for me. And then all of a sudden, you start to watch it, and you realize it's not what it is, but you don't right. know that going in. You think, oh, these people are really supportive and it's building confidence and it's all, it's all the, you don't know what it is. And then no. you see the, the outcome and you're just, you know, it's jaw dropping. So well, I just was curious. That, and no, I had, I had no idea that that was going on. None whatsoever. And I guess I wasn't what they were looking for, but, um, I, I remember later coming back to Vancouver for a wedding and I had, I hooked up with some uh, for brunch with some people from the show and we were having brunch. And one of the women was like, basically told me like, you know, Allison's in a cult that brands people. And I was like, no, of course. That's what everybody said. No, I was like, what are you talking about? No. And then like six months later it came out and I was yeah. like, wow. Um, but yeah, she had a dog named phantom and I had Shasta and they were buds. And well, that's she nice. was always, you know, we didn't hang out a lot outside of set, but, she was always really nice on set. By the way, random non sequitur. If Longmire came to you and said, we want to do a movie, the Longmire movie or a short new series, would you do it? Yeah. You would? Absolutely. You love doing it? I did. Who did you love working with on that show? I loved working with um, a lot of our directors were really awesome. Very talented, very uh, efficient Chris Chulak was, um, he did our pilot and a, a lot of our season finales. Um, our camera department, Jimmy Muro was our, one of our DPs. Um, and, uh, he, he's like a legend. He's like, he was like the original camera study cam operator. Um, and he, whenever he directed, he was, sometimes he couldn't find words. He'd be like, <laughs> And I'd be like, yes, I think I know what you mean. And I think I'm going to make that happen. Uh, But he just had so much passion and he has such a beautiful eye with the camera. Cameron Duncan was our other DP who was incredibly talented as well. And um, our crew was so badass. Uh, And I love working. Adam Bartley is like a brother to me. Um, He played the Ferg and he and I not only came from stage and, you know, we're both cherubs different years we, we just we came we were cut from the same cloth and it felt really familiar and fun to be with him and, and katie sackoff is a total supporter rad chick to be on yeah, a show she's with she's rad um, she's been on the show a couple of times and, she's she's an awesome yeah. awesome person yeah we're still we're still dear friends and um i can't believe we had kids so close together um and uh I can't think of anyone that wasn't awesome. Lou Diamond Phillips is a sweetheart and, and so like eager to do new things. And, um, Rob is just Rob, Rob is Rob, Robert Taylor, who was our sheriff, um, all the way from Australia. He was just authentic as hell. You light up, you light up. And I say, I mentioned Longmire. I just, that you just, Mm -hmm. I don't have to say much. You just kind of open up about, wow. It sounds like you would do this in a heartbeat. This was like a family to you. 
Yeah, yeah, they really were. I love it. They really were a family. But the gemstones, the righteous gemstones, your amber gemstone, you're uh, you're playing in a le- with a legendary cast with John Goodman and Danny McBride. You're Danny McBride's wife, Amber. Um, I haven't watched all of it. I've watched two episodes. I, I was kind of just blown away. It's just kind of absolutely nuts. And I understand what you say when it's like you get a little bit, it's overwhelming sometimes and all these people who are, their minds just keep going and keep going and you're trying to play catch up. Um, what is it that, paint the picture where you're in a scene and everybody's improvising. What do you do? Do you try to step up and you're trying to be on their level? Or you just like, know your lines, know the scene, know where it's going and just, just react, listen and react. What do you do? Um, Cause you never know what's coming at you with Danny McBride. You don't, you don't No, you don't. And I love that. Um, this is, it, it is an, it is an incredible cast of people to be working with. I feel so lucky. I have, by the way, I have to be honest with you. I'm going to, I'm like, I'm only cutting you off for a second. Then I want you to continue. Cut me off. But every t- it. When I watch it, I, I love John Goodman. He's one of my favorites of all time. He's just a brilliant actor. But when I see him on this set in the hot Charleston, South Carolina, I have to imagine he's the biggest pain in the ass in the world and wants to be upset. Like I could just imagine him wanting to like going, get me off the set. Are we done here? No, no, no. He's so he's the opposite. He is. He's Thank God. I thought for sure he'd be miserable. Oh, no, we're always worried. We're like, are we going to really, are we going to give John heat stroke? Are we like, what's happening? Cause he won't leave set. He'll be like, no, let's do it again. Let's do it again. And someone will be like, let's rest in the cooling tent. And that's like, you know, have a drink of water. Good. Like, no, let's go. Like he's so, he's so dedicated. He's really hard on himself in a really uh, like in interesting way. I don't want to say cute or adorable. Like I, I, I like it because I identify with it. Someone who holds themselves to high standards. I think you probably can too, given our conversation. Right. Um, he's not at all. He is, he is such a team player, uh, almost to a fault. Almost, almost sometimes to, wow. uh, to all of us. Cause, cause we, you know, those are very hot days and this season in particular, which we just started shooting. I just had my first week of work last week. Um, We started the season in June. So it is a scorcher out there. Um, By the way, what what, what do you do though? What do you like? How do you not, first off, how do you not laugh? Well, finish your thought, Dan, I'm sorry. Finish your thought on (laughs) the improv and it's all around you and people are throwing shit around you. And what are you feeling like? Yeah, look, if look, if if I that's a good question on what do I do in that moment? Because there have been other interviewers or people who have kind of described Amber, specifically actually Eli and Amber, as sort of meaning John Goodman's character being the the straight people in like a wacky world. Um I actually think Amber's wacky in her own way, but she's not the same kind of wacky. So if was if Cassidy was doing an improv with Edie and Danny and Adam and Tim and you know that would be I would maybe act differently but Amber is not trying to one up Amber is um she watches and then she makes like these strikes whenever she can calculating so she's calculating yes she's calculating that's a great that's a great word <laughs> and and she um and she but she's also emotional and she and she's sensitive um everyone in the show is it's just I love that this kind of comedy is comedy based in these characters being really real in their own world and mine. But to the, to the, you know, to the outside world, to the people who are watching it, they are out of their fucking minds. Danny but McBride, in their own yeah. mind, in their own world are so cool. Danny McBride they, is my favorite comedian. Now I tested for Eastbound and down for the last season and almost got it. And he came up to me at a party and was like, you don't know how close you were. We were going to get, we're going to get you cast. We got to bring you in something else. And then there was something that they were auditioning or, uh, was, I was up for, for this season of, um, of gemstones, but I couldn't do it cause I'm not available, but I'm like, it was like, I know it's awesome. It's some kind of cousin character some kind of crazy you probably know already don't you why aren't you available i know wouldn't that be awesome i mean it's just oh, like that I, but, but he is like my it's like my dream to work with him and just go just be on the set with him and like what is something you remember can you remember some how hard a is it to keep a straight face when he's improvising and throws shit at you how often do you break character and laugh 
and see um, what's the funniest thing he's ever said that you remember that you just could not keep a straight face. Okay. A, how do I not laugh? I do laugh. And I, does he get mad? I actually, no, 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 no one ever gets mad at laughing. I feel worse when I laugh off camera because then I'm <laughs> fucking it up for them. Um, because I can't hold it in. Uh, I know Amber, I think does a lot of like looking down because Cassidy is going to lose her mind. <laughs> uh, what was B? B was, um, what happened? We laugh a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot of laughing, especially, um, I think the amount of laughing during improvisations in that show could be directly linked to what time of day it is that we're shooting. So those 3 a.m. scenes where we're all just like super loop, we were going to have to just like add an hour to that day because there's going to be a lot of laughing and no, no one gets mad. I can't think, and I'm going straight to see, I'm really going to answer your questions here. I don't think there's one thing that I can think that Danny has said that has made me, the things that make me laugh the most, honestly, is when he laughs. When some when something tickles him, it it's the greatest thing ever. Have you and made him laugh? Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, and it makes me and he, and he'll tell me about it too. That's also what I love. He'll like text me or be like, oh, "I love that part." He's so he's so kind and he's so gracious, um, and he has no sense of like uh, ego or it's just it's just really incredibly warm and inviting and safe. Uh, and he'll let you know when you did a great job. And it just feels oh, really nice. Uh, I love it. Uh, Righteous Gemstone season four is coming out. Three. Season three. I don't want to jump the gun. We're shooting season three right now. We had to, we lost a year to COVID. Right, right. Like um, quickly, Vampire Diaries. Do you go to Comic Cons? Oh. Do you ever sign autographs for Vampire Diaries? Do people ever come up and notice you from Vampire Diaries? We just took a hard left turn. We did. Uh, yeah, they. I, I don't sign autographs for Vampire Diaries, um, not because I wouldn't. I just have never really been asked. And wow. uh, I do get recognized by very specific. I, I can, a fun game when someone goes like, I love your work, is for me to go, what are they talking about? <laughs> do they know me? That's a, Which so that's a fun game yeah. where I go like, what do they, what do I think they've seen? Don't, don't um, you love when people come up to you and go, what have I seen you in? That's just like, oh, come on. Don't come up to me. <laughs> don't do it. Don't fucking do it. Just, you know what? If you recognize me from something, come up to me and say, I loved you on that. Or I liked you on that. Or you could have right. been better on that. But don't say, what do I? Because I look like an idiot coming up with what I think you saw me in. That's a horrible thing to do. I know it's like, small, though. What you should do is... Go to go to IMDb Pro and just look me up, and then you tell me. You yeah. tell me. Yeah. You know me because from. I've said most of the time I go, oh, it's got to be Smallville. Like a Smallville. Like, no, no. I did that once, and when I when I was first on Smallville, and I was like, well, I'm in Smallville, and they were like, it's not that. And I think they actually knew me from like the neighborhood, which was really embarrassing. Uh, but no, no one does that to me. That's awful. I think that's an LA thing, though. I think people do that in LA because they assume when they recognize someone, it's from something. Right. Living in Santa Fe and and, and being in the South a lot for Charleston in Charleston and and the surrounding area, a lot of people will go. Now, are you my church group? How do I know you? Do you get? Did you go to school with my son? And I'll be like, <laughs> Did you watch a show called Longmire? And they'll be like, Oh hell yeah, oh, I did. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Yeah. Oh, you're, you're Katie Longmire. No, you're or this is this. You're Longmire's dirt. Dirt. That's the word. Dirt. I got that last week. Oh you're Longmire's dirt. I just I loved it. I was I was watching. He was on. I was on a turlet. <laughs> um, this is called shit talking with Cassidy Freeman, folks. Uh, if you're a Patreon, if you're a top Patreon, go to patreoncom society. You get to ask questions. Uh, the top tiers get to ask questions. And thanks for the support. Uh, of the podcast. This is shit talking with Cassie Freeman. This is rapid fire. We're going to ask you fan questions and you just boom, rapidly go. This has been terrific. It's going by so fast. Nico, what's one of your biggest pet peeves? Ooh, for some reason I want to say nails on a chalkboard, but no one actually ever does that. I just hate that sound. Yeah, it's bad. Um, Chewing one of my pet peeves is people telling you uh, what you should do. People telling you what you should do. 
You know what yeah. you should do? Yeah. Yeah. People always say you that. You know, you know I, I do that too. Well, you know what you should do, Ryan? You like, you should go F yourself because I ain't listening to your stupid advice. Oh my God. You should totally like, you know, get, get your chart read by this person. You oh know, my like, gosh. You have to get this. these sneakers. They'll make your back feel better for days. Oh my God. Yeah. No. Little Lisa. Can you please share any funny behind the scenes stories while filming Smallville? Anything funny quickly? Funny. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Justin Hartley trying to lift me in a, in his green arrow shoes that were heels and uh, both of us almost falling over every single time. That's funny. <laughs> Amazing. Super Sam. Tess went through a huge change from her introduction to the final episode to the point of being a completely different person at the end. Did you know that would be happening when accepting the role? No, I had no idea what Tess Mercer's uh, journey was going to be. And I thought it was really cool when she kind of became part of Watchtower. When did you find out that Lex Luthor was going to come back in season 10 and kill you? <laughs> We're talking about ourselves in the third person. We are. We um, certainly are. Not till very late. I Honestly, there was a lot of like uh, talk of whether you would do it. I but called them two weeks before or a week and a half before or something like that. And I just said, hey, you guys got me for next Friday. Whatever you want to do, you have me for the full day. Yeah. That so was it. Was like, it I hope fast. Rosie's back. I want Rosie back. Yeah. And we got to do a scene out of all that time. We, we got to do a scene together. Did. And I got to kill my sister. And I got to erase your memory. You did. You bitch. Will F. OMG. I love Longmire. How was it working with Robert Taylor? Which you already said to Loon Diamond Phillips. You already said that. Okay. Well, done. You loved them. Bob K. I any possibility of a Longmire movie? I asked that too. And I, you said you would do it if, if it was approached. I would do it. I have no idea. All right. I hear you. Raj, tell me about a time someone unexpectedly showed you kindness. That's a beautiful question. It really is. And it's something we don't think about often, isn't it? It really is something we don't think about often. Something kind of, it could be anything. If you open the door for you, it could be. Right. Well, I was going to say, I've been traveling a lot with my newborn alone. And the amount of people who have offered to help me with my bags, hold her, snap that carrier thingy on my back. Um, help me put a car seat in a bag. Like they're really and men and women. Um, there are plenty of people who breeze by me, not giving a fuck, but the people that, that ask are really kind. And that's, I think it gives me warm fuzzies. Love you in gemstones. I asked you this, but you, uh, this person wants to know uh, how hard is it not to break character in that show? Honestly, is it a hard, is it a very difficult thing to ch kind of keep that face to keep in character? I mean, you get you 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 get used to it, and you kind of get to know what kind of jokes each character might come up with. But then there are some things that just hit you sideways, and everyone loses their minds. Like if you've seen the the beginning of season two, which you haven't, but you might. Um, there's this whole scene about Disney characters. That's all I'll say. None of that was written, and it was hilarious. Really, it just goes on and on. It just goes on and on. Like, I think our camera department must hate us um, because we just never, we just keep going. So you don't cut. You, the, the video still rolls and rolls. For If you have a one-page scene, it might be 20 minutes for that one scene. That's correct. So you never know. Like, you know the scene has already ended and you're still doing this scene. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. And you like doing it. Yes. <laughs> yes. I yeah, because that's where the magic happens. Is it exhausting, though? It is exhausting, isn't it? You know what's exhausting is is take take 15 is exhausting. Oof. You would hope that it could be a little shorter. Um, <laughs> no, the improv the improv days are not exhausting. That, I think, I mean, for I'm speaking for me. I think the crew would tell you differently. Um, for me, those days are not exhausting. The exhausting days are the logistical days where you're like, everyone's walking in and this person and that person. And, you know, you don't say anything, but you're like, you got to do things over and over again to get timing right. That can be exhausting, but it's all part, it's all part of the process. You know, so many people ask me, when is Cassidy Freeman coming on the podcast? I've really, I've truly, no, I've, I've truly do. had that question asked quite often. And I'm, I'm so glad that you and I finally got a chance to sit down and talk. It's been a tremendous treat. I hope it was fun for you. Super fun. I feel like we could go on and on. I really do, but we'll save that for maybe next time. 
great. We'll definitely do it next time. I'm so proud of you. I'm so happy for you and Ben wow. and Gigi. She's the cutest Thank little you. girl. And is it difficult uh, working? Is it Does it make working harder when you have a little one? Learning lines, um, all those things. Nah, she makes everything better. What an answer. Perfect answer. Uh, mm-hmm. Thank you for allowing me to be inside of you today. This has been a real oh. treat. Yeah, listen, yes, feelings mutual. All right. I love you and Thanks. I wish you only the best and we will talk soon. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> uh all i could say is i i love cassidy freeman she's cool that I, was uh it was a fun interview and uh she's such a sweetheart it's cool now that i'm starting righteous gemstones <laughs> season two it's cool uh seeing her in it having yes. talked to her now she's really good in that show. she's really funny yeah i had an opportunity to maybe be on that show and i turned it down opportunity for the you know yeah I let my anxiety get in the way, folks. Uh, anyway, uh, that was really fun. Uh, if you want to listen to all the information I gave you in the uh, opening of this podcast, just rewind, go back. There's tons of stuff about the Inside of You online store and Patreon. Make sure you join Patreon to support the podcast if you can. It really helps. I love my patrons. Go to patreon.com slash inside of you. Right now, I'm going to do a little uh, reading of all the top tier names who make this podcast really possible. Also, thank you to Westwood One, our Cumulus, and to Ryan Teas, to Bryce, my producer. Congratulations. He just had a little baby, Beckham. Mm-hmm. So Bryce Mollers, make sure you, you send him a, a, a message uh, congratulating him. Cute little baby, and um, I'm very happy for him and Logan. And uh, yeah, I love the guy. That's cool. Yeah, he's good. Beckham's the name of the baby. Beckham. 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 Bex. Here we go, Beckham. Uh, top tiers. Here they are. Nancy D, Leah S, Sarah V, Little Lisa, Yukiko, Jill E, Brian H, Nico P, Robert B, Jason W, Kristen K, Raj C, Joshua G, Raj, Joshua D, C, J, P, Jennifer, N, Stacy L, Jamal F, Janelle B, Kimberly E, Mikey, Yeldon, Supremo, 99 more, Ramira, Santiago M, Chad W, Leanne P, Maya P, Maddie S, Belinda N. Correct. Chris H, Dave H, Sheila G, Brad D, Ray H, Tabitha T, Tom N, Suzanne B, Liliana A, Talia M, Betsy D, Chad L, Marion, uh, Meg K, Dan N, Big Stevie W. Correct. Angel M, Rian and C, Corey K. Dev Nixon, Michelle A, Jeremy C, Andy T, Gavinator, David C. What was that? Your dog barking. Oh. John B, Brandy D, Yavor, Camille S, the C. C. Joey M, Design, OTG. O-T-G. Eugene and Leah. Leah. Chris P, Nikki G, Corey, Katie B, Nicole, Patricia, Heather L, Jake B, James B, Megan T, Mel S, Orlando C, Caroline R, Rob E, Paul C, Christine S, Sarah S, Eric H, Jennifer R, and last but not least, Shane R, Emma R, Mark M, Jeremy, Jeremy, Spoken. Jeremy V, Andrew M, Robert G, Zatoichi 77, Andreas N, Alexandra, Chris R, Michael F, Samantha W, Michelle D. You guys rock. I love saying your names. I don't care how long this list is. You're supporting the podcast. I love you. I thank you. Thanks for supporting the podcast. Thanks to my guest, Cassidy Freeman, for spending a nice hour with us and getting to know her and getting to know what makes her tick. And uh, be good to yourselves today. Be good to yourselves every week. You only got you, so look after you. Get that therapy if you need it. You know, Take a walk if you need it. Play goalie if you need it. Play goalie if you need it. <laughs> I need um, it. You, yeah. Apparently. Apparently. Uh, I'm Michael Rosenbaum from the Hollywood Hills in California. I'm Ryan Tez from the same location. Nice wave over to you. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you next week.